by profession, I'm a you know computer programmer. I have a background in cryptography. I worked in uh, uh, you know my cryptography background is old but relevant to this particular problem. Uh, during October 20, you know, 2021, something like that, uh, I think it was during COVID, uh, I was looking for a hard problem to solve, which would keep me occupied for a while. And uh, I bumped into the Indescript problem. Uh, you know, I, I tried it and it worked. And uh, that is, that's how I got into it. So how did you go about it? How did the breakthrough happen? And how did you, cons- uh, you know, first up convince yourself that you've got it right? Uh, so there's a paper by uh, uh, Claude Shannon. Claude Shannon is the uh, father of information theory and uh, he has uh, actually a paper that was written in 1945 that was classified because it you know in those days encryption was considered a, um, a weapon okay and uh, it was recently really, but after a few years later it was uh, declassified and in that he describes something called the unicity distance which means that no matter what the cipher is you can calculate a certain amount of letters that if you read then there can be no other way to read it so uh, once I crossed that threshold, I knew that this is the, you know, this is, this is right. And the rest of it was just about being able to write the paper in such a way that a person with, you know, uh, high school math or, you know, can understand it, can understand, you know, may- maybe they don't understand it in depth, but they understand yes, this is correct. So if you have a random uh, data, if you generate some random data, like maybe you take it, take it from a radio noise, or DNA, or just a random number generator, and start assigning values to it, it will be complete, completely garbage. You won't find any words. And this is because in uh, language, the symbol space we use, which means to say that the amount of words we can create and the actual amount of valid words, if you look at the ratio, it is very, very small. It is like 0.1%. So if you look at uh, all the three letter possible words in English, it is 26 to the power three but there are only about 500 words that are actually valid. So most most words are, uh, most uh, combinations of symbols are garbage. So you will see garbage if you if it's just random. Now, uh, words of a different language are garbage in words in your language. Otherwise, you would understand every language. I mean, you may, you may think it's a different word, but you would be able to parse every language. And the words in your own language, if you change the symbols, it will make words, but it'll be it'll be all wrong, it'll be garbage. So once I was able to read certain words, and then I started looking up the meanings of these words, and they were all, so many of them were rare Rigvedic words that are not even attested in Atharva Veda or uh, Puranas or anything else. So those words, and they're long words. So if you if you randomly assign letters, it would it would create, occasionally it would create short words, like, you know, two, one syllable word or something like this, two syllable words. But getting long words that are meaningful and consistent in the same theme, that was uh, pretty much convincing for me. But of course, it's not a mathematical proof, so I had to mathematically prove it as well. So when you have uh, uh, when you have text without spaces, you have to parse it in a, in a, in a particular way. And the, depending on how you parse it, you could get different meanings. And in fact, a lot of Indian poetry is based on uh, parsing a thing differently to get generate different meanings. Okay, like it's called Slasher poetry. So um, when I started parsing it, um, so you know, initially I parsed it as a greedy parser, and I just you know, as long as I got all the words for me, the phonotactics was right, and that's the language, and I'm leaving the rest to the Sanskrit scholars. The phonotactics essentially is uh, uh, the constraint where certain l- sequences of sounds don't occur yeah. in a language. It's different for each language. For example, in Sanskrit, uh, you don't get anything that is a voiced stop followed by unvoiced stop. So you, you don't have, um, you know, ga, ka or ja, cha or something like that. It doesn't occur in the dictionary. The exception is the and uh, the and her, but otherwise it doesn't occur. Like there's no, uh, and many words like, uh, so for example, if I say, hey, ma, you know what it is? If I say, hey, na, there's no word like that. So th- there are homo- uh, there are uh, phonotactics like this, which uh, tell you that if the, if you can assign words, then the language is correct, the, you know, it's just the rest is just parsing but the you know when i announced it I just i didn't have any following and i, I guess the people who are uh, good in sanskrit they said well you know this doesn't have proper grammar and so on so i started learning the grammar and trying to read it again with grammar and then it was very shocking because um, one of the things i learned was that you know, it is the entire corpus is readable with paninian grammar okay so the grammar is essentially uh, not, not entire, there are a couple of Vedic forms, but most of it is um, 
readable as uh, sanskrit grammar so that was very shocking uh, the other shocking thing was the script was abugida now, now you have to appreciate the old scripts from that time the bronze age they were all like uh, you know syllabic or uh, logographic or something like that like an abugida script from the bronze age is uh, very impressive mm. so uh, so yeah so it it is uh, you know it, it is it is a very wonderful script uh, it's great to read all these things from 4000 4500 years you know old inscriptions wow. the first what we call graffiti the first uh, you know evidence of the script is actually from 4000 bc eventually over um, time it got standardized so if you look at the early stages of the script around the early harappan period 3a there are only 71 signs okay so 71 signs is a very small number that it cannot be logographic it wouldn't make sense to have uh, you know for a script to be uh, like that and then we start seeing new signs being added now 5100 and four or something bce is a calculation for rama's birth which means ramayana around around that so do you think rigveda precedes ramayana yes it could be earlier than it could be earlier because ramayana refers to the river saraswati right. tamasa hmm. which is crossed hmm. by bharata hmm. when he wants to visit kaikeyi right so the existence of the river saraswati adored in the rigveda hmm. as a mighty flowing river hmm. definitely makes it earlier than the ramayana right i think when you look at the chart prepared by angus madison for the european union before the for a oecd before the union was formed right angus madison made, made a brilliant chart hmm. he narrated the economic history of the world for 2000 years 2000 years from one common era to 2000 right he documented the contribution made by different countries to this world gdp look at the first bar in one c common era india accounted for 33% of the world gdp china accounted only for 25% right the later on there was a progressive decline i even up to 1700 in 1700 india was still contributing 27% of the gdp yes. so that means the continuity of activity the textile merchants right the people who are producing this rice wheat cereals right people who are working with cotton textiles right the even silk was found in the uh, saraswati civilization so variety of material the ayurvedic technologies surgery technologies and all the evolving which are recorded in our ancient texts seem to have contributed to this wealth of the nation so we are able to explain using the resources that have been found so today we have a solid evidence of 8000 inscriptions rishi grisamada in the rigveda refers to saraswati in three metaphors ambitame naditame devitame saraswati aprasasthai vasmasi prasasthim mamma naskruti amma adhi adhi prasasthi gime prasasthi what are you you are an amma great amma you are a great devi you are also a great river so why does he call her a great mother by the metaphor because that river nurtured the civilization and now we have out of the 2600 archaeological sites of the civilization 2000 are not on sindhu they are on the river saraswati, saraswati. river basin So that proves Rama of Kutch was a vibrant Saraswati port, Correct. taking all these goods through the Persian Gulf into Tigris Euphrates yes. and into Haifa. Right. So th- this is a very fascinating discussion that uh, we've had. Thank you very much, Dr. Kalyan Raman.